And it is now officially 421, so I think we can go ahead and start. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our second panel of the year with C-Lab. Uh, this month, our um, educational panel is being co-hosted by Cannabis Lab as well as Flower Hire. Cannabis Lab is a network and association of cannabis industry professionals who get together and work together to build a stronger and more uh, strong community within the industry. If you want information on the work that C-Lab does, as well as information on becoming either a sponsor or a member yourself, go ahead and visit www.joincelab.com. And of course, you can always DM yeah. me or anyone on this panel if you want to have more details there as well. Um, Flower Hire and is actually the company I work for. Flower Hire is an executive search firm that uh, strives to building a stronger and more equitable cannabis community through placing great people in great jobs. So if you are in cannabis and you are either looking to join a team or build a team, that is what we do best. So once again, you can DM me or stay tuned afterwards for more information. Uh, today, I am very, very excited to have you join us today. Um, we decided to put together a panel with some experts on a topic that everyone has been interested in, and that is talking about the rise of LinkedIn as the Duriger platform for cannabis social media. And what I think is really interesting about this is that, you know, when you think about all of the social media platforms out there, you know, LinkedIn has always been considered like the most buttoned up and kind of the most conservative one. But, you know, as a surprise, it ends up being the number one uh, platform for us as an industry. Um, and one thing that we've seen out of that is that because there is less, less, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, regulation necessarily or censorship on there, we do see a little bit more of a flourish of really great conversations. And from that, we have seen the rise of the cannabis uh, influencer, which are three of the people that I brought together today, people who really stand for the promotion of the industry, using the platform to educate, to connect, and really drive the industry forward. So without further ado, let me pass the torch on to some really great speakers. I know you guys didn't come here to see me. So um, I would like to introduce to you our guest. Uh, first up, we have Sarah Stewart, who is the co-founder of Ritual Cannabis Hospitality. Um, they provide consulting services in the consumption lounge development area. Um, many of you will already have seen and known her from LinkedIn. Um, I consider her an industry futurist because she is always great at putting out information regarding what's next for the industry. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have uh, Brittany Parker, who is the founder of A Green Legacy. Green Legacy is an influencer marketing, PR, and marketing um, consultancy that really helps bring new people into the space and help kind of level up that area of marketing and PR when it comes to new businesses. Brittany, I know you can do this better than me, so I'm going to give you a minute to talk in a minute, um, but I just want to say welcome for being here, and I love what you're putting out there on social media. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And finally, uh, I have I invited this guy on. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. His name is Brett Profenbarger, and I would say he is probably one of the well most well known and most well recognized um, influencers when it comes to LinkedIn. Um, he is the VP of Marketing with Green Check Verified, um, and beyond that, just a total thought like thought leader and provocateur when it comes to um, you know stirring up some lively conversations on LinkedIn. Uh, actually, no, not just on the virtual world, but in real life as well. So welcome, Brett. Thanks for having me and life goal achieved. I've always wanted to be called a provocateur. Oh, I'm so yes. happy to make that happen for you. I will call you that only that moving forward. Um, so before we jump in, I wanted to drop a little statistic that we figured out amongst ourselves. In 2022, we actually pulled together everyone's combined content view and engagement on LinkedIn. And between the people on the screen, we actually saw over 8 million points of engagement on LinkedIn, which is an amazing, amazing statistic to see for our industry. And it just goes to show, you know, if you 
if people care about what you're talking about, they will continue to listen. And so it's very lucky that we have this platform to, to share our knowledge. So um, with that being said, if let me ask you this first question, because I think this is a great way for all of our audience to kind of get to know each of you a little bit better. The term LinkedIn influencer, I think you guys kind of like adopt this name begrudgingly, right? I don't think anyone ever sets out to like be, I want to be a LinkedIn influencer when I grow up, right? But, you know, now that this has kind of become a thing, in your mind, what is the difference between being a LinkedIn influencer and being an influencer on other platforms? What does that mean to you and how is it different? Uh, I'm going to actually send this to you, Brett. Why don't you start us? Ooh, all right. I love being put on the spot. I, I think it really comes down to a couple of things. Number one being the quality of the connection and the people who are intaking your content are different, right? And it's not to say that any human being is a higher quality than another in like a human sense, but on Instagram, Twitter, you know, Facebook, whatever, they're consumers. They're, you know, Joe Blow from the street. They're buying a product in the, the LinkedIn universe. You're influencing uh, decision makers within companies, right? Like they're directors and vice presidents and C-suite members of various companies. So I think that's number one that makes it a little bit different. So the, the content is a little different. And I think number two that makes it a little bit different is that you can be what you are, particularly for like me in the marketing world without the mask on, right? Like if I'm, if I'm marketing to the, to the consumer world, I don't want them to, to realize what I'm doing is a drip campaign or what I'm doing is stringing them into a sales funnel. I want them to fall for it. In this world, we know the game we're playing. We can have an open conversation about what we do and people don't judge you. And, and that for me is a big one, at least in the you know media marketing PR landscape. Yeah, I, I would agree with Brett on that. Um, I think another thing that makes LinkedIn so different is that your reputation can be seen. Um, people are more familiar with who you are within your nine to five career journey, but also who you are as a person. Like Brett said, I think um, when it comes to being an influencer on LinkedIn, things as basic as just your profile. It really serves as essentially your website, whether or not you have one, because people are able to see what you've done, what you're doing. And, and we're not just talking about like laughs and ha-has. We're talking about, you know, what you have decided to dedicate your life to, um, whether that's your career or otherwise. Uh, and they're also able to see your career journey too. Um, so it, it serves as almost a mini autobiography <laughs> as far as your professional world. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of uh, reputation. You can see someone's reputation is, is really beyond what they're saying. Uh, you can see it through their profile and through what they post on LinkedIn. And I also feel like you're kind of just uh, now targeted to talking to people who care. Like we all follow people on social media that post things that we don't really care about, but we care about them. So we continue to follow them. Whereas on LinkedIn, the conversations are are different. They're more engaging. You talk about user generated content and getting, you know, engagement and responses from that. I see a lot more of that happening on LinkedIn than other uh, Instagram or other platforms. I totally agree. And you're right. You know, I think in other platforms, you're looking a lot at people following a person or a character, whereas here, you know, on LinkedIn, it's really about following the conversation. You know, what are people talking about this new news development? What are people saying about this new market development? And it creates a lot more of, of engaged conversation. Also, let's let's drop this in here too. You know, why LinkedIn? How did this even happen, guys? I mean, Brittany, you are our you know, resident influencer marketing specialist, like how in the world did LinkedIn become the bell of the ball when it comes to social media for us? You know, I mean, there's very few places where we can go and not be shut down. And even though people are still getting kicked off of LinkedIn every now and again, um, it's been the most receptive. Uh, it's, it's the most mainstream uh, 
social media platform that's been accepting of us. I mean, we do have others like Reddit is also one that is very receptive to cannabis. Um, but Reddit is built on people being anonymous. And so LinkedIn has been the one place where people are actually able to show who they are, um, but then also show the business or the career trajectory for some people who are here to find new jobs or to elevate their career. Um, you're able to do both of those things through LinkedIn and there's really nowhere else like it. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting a lot of my news from LinkedIn even, um, and just based on the amount of people that you follow and the, the you know, I, I started LinkedIn by really following people like Alice Moon, who were kind of catering to the industry and but was also an influencer within herself. She was helping small businesses grow. She was helping small accounts grow, but she was also doing it in a way that was showing that she was also in the business. She wasn't just influencing. She was helping in such a bigger way. And it really showed me early on that LinkedIn is going to be more than just a social media platform here. It's going to be a connector of dots. It's going to bring people together. It's going to be helpful for jobs. Um, so I think that's why LinkedIn is going to be so big in cannabis and continue to be. I love that shout out because I also started following Alice Moon early in my career and she same like she really was kind of one of those aspirational people. So uh, Alice, if you're watching, thank you. <laughs> Your That's impact the, has really had the ripple effect here. Um, yes, so, and it's kind of full circle too, because Alice was a speaker at an Agreen Legacy event in the first year of, of business. So I definitely love some Alice Moon. Let's make sure she sees this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, let's, let's take it a little bit more personal now. You know, we, we talk about how, you know, the LinkedIn experience has really kind of had an impact on how cannabis the cannabis industry has grown and developed, but what about personally? Like, can you guys tell us a little bit about how, you know, being on LinkedIn and having this platform has changed you and your work? Yeah. Um, so interestingly enough, I was on LinkedIn back in the day. Um, for those who do know me, I used to be a teacher, but then I um, transitioned into tech and one of my very first jobs moving into tech marketing was coaching sales folks at Microsoft around how to use LinkedIn and how to use LinkedIn Sales Navigator and Twitter in order to prospect and um, build relationships with their prospects and their, and their customers. And so LinkedIn was always a really big part of my life. Uh, especially after I left education and I was looking for a new job, but then I got my new job and so much of my role um, revolved around LinkedIn. Uh, once I moved into cannabis, interestingly enough, those I was in sales in my first cannabis role at Leafly. And I remember being like, we need to be on LinkedIn. And my manager was like, no, nobody in cannabis is on LinkedIn. Um, and at the time there, it wasn't, it wasn't popping like it is today, but it, it was, there were a few people on there, uh, seeing how it's evolved has been wonderful. But, um, I think the bigger thing is that there's not a whole lot of people who are willing to, there's obviously we know that we are still dealing with stigma as it relates to cannabis. Even thinking about my own dad, who I took to MJ Unpacked with me, he was like, oh, Brittany, this, this is cannabis. It's not just you all smoking weed all day and da 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 da. But I think that um, because we are really outspoken about the cannabis industry, I think um, it is, there's so many people who are just curious what it's about. They're curious about what the cannabis industry is and what it isn't. And um, I would say, I know for me, it's really most of my leads for my business come from LinkedIn. And it's partially because uh, there's not a lot of people who talk about cannabis on LinkedIn that talk about it with consistency. Um, there's not a lot of people who will have their unpopular opinions and just say them. And so I've had numerous conversations with people, um, with prospects who we get on the phone and they're like, oh my God, I love your post. 
because they're so real. They're so blah, 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 blah. Or like, I just have this image of you being this way. And I'm like, no, that, that A, that literally is how I am. But, uh, but it's also this piece where I think people find the things that I post and the things that Brett posts and Sarah posts as so real. And I think that that's why we've been able to get a level of engagement and get a level of community um, that actually is really impactful. I know it's been very impactful to my business, um, but it's also been impactful for me just as a person who has strong opinions about things within cannabis. So, um, yeah, it's it's been huge. I, I think one of the things that you said that really is interesting is, you know, this idea of being real and and really exposing yourself in an authentic way, exposing yourself, you know, showing yourself in an authentic way on LinkedIn. You know, I think so many social media platforms are so they're they're full of posturing, yes. right? This is me. This is my perfect life. This is my perfect whatever. But cannabis, by definition, is imperfect. We're all just figuring it out. And on LinkedIn, we can figure it out together. You know, so that's something that I think resonates with a lot of people and creates, you know, these great conversations. Now, Brett, I'm going to toss it back to you because in our earlier conversations, you mentioned something about one of the great kind of byproducts of being on LinkedIn in regards to um, when you go to conferences. And I'd love for you to talk about that with our audience. Oh, yeah. So I want to touch a little bit on what Brittany said before I get into sure. that and all kind of tie together. I, I think that for me personally, I got on LinkedIn because my wife told me to stop arguing with people on Facebook and to come argue with people on LinkedIn because they were better people. Um, yeah. And I will double down on the authenticity. I will say that when I started with my original plan, right, the original thing that I said, this is what I'm going to do is I wanted to have the conversations that we all have around the water cooler in public. Like, let's say the quiet part out loud, because everybody knows once you've been in weed a couple of years, you don't have not weed friends anymore. <laughs> so all of your conversations are around, you know, the industry, the community, the advocacy, the plant, something. And you end up having these same conversations with all of your friends and your colleagues and your connections over and over and over. Why not just do that in public, right? Like, let's, hey, I got an opinion. This is what I think about insert thing. Let's argue about it. And I think the, the biggest impact for me has been the ability to watch experts go at it in a nuanced and intelligent way in the comment section. Because if you say some off the wall shit, people are going to check you. And then those people are going to get checked by other people. And you can watch three or four PhDs have conversations you have to Google for the rest of the day. And it's cool. And I think the other big one that you asked directly about is this sense of support amongst the community, right? It's not this like competitive thing. Like, it's not like, oh, I want to do good. And I want these ladies to do bad because I want my content to be bigger. It ends up becoming this like collaborative community building thing. And I think MJ BizCon was probably one of the best instances of that, right? Once you had a certain level of notoriety on the social media world, you kind of get a taste of what celebrities get in some way where it's like every five feet is somebody you want to talk to. But those, those shining moments are when it's a person you know and it takes it from being this awkward exchange to it's almost like a freaking family reunion where I'm like, oh my God, I know your opinions. We've had conversations. <laughs> Give me a hug. Like, yes. I've never met you, but I know you. Like, that is That's what, what happened with me and Brett. When we yeah, saw I was gonna him, say, when I, I sneak eat into the press room. Don't tell anybody. I, I literally just walked in and was like, yeah, I'm press. Like, let the guy with the masters in PR in the press room and see what happens, right? Like, <laughs> Uh, but for real, that's what it becomes, right? Like there was this moment and uh, I'll shout out to the three good buds guys, right? They wanted to do this live session. I was standing there and I sat there for a minute and I was looking around and I'm like, dude, there's probably a hundred million content views a year in this group. There's probably a million followers sitting here right now, just sitting here smoking weed outside under an umbrella that we had to get the like the cleanup guy to steal for us. You know what I mean? Like it's this it's this very communal thing where we have kind of expanded 
our smoke sesh circle to the world digitally. And you can see that in the live events. It doesn't matter which live event it is, it becomes this thing. And I'll throw out my own Alice Moon love thing. I will never forget being at Benzinga, Miami. Me, Alice Moon, David Palachuk, I guess arguably three very well-known people. All we wanted was to go get water. And we got stopped 19 times by people. Just, can I get a selfie? I love your content. Like it was this thing. So it's like, and that's really cool. Like, it's like, oh my God, people care, right? Like three or four years ago, I was a mid-level marketing guy at a nothing company, just toiling away for peanuts. And now it's a whole different worldview. And I'm going to let everybody in on the secret. Anybody could do what we do. It is not special. You have to put in the work. There's a format to it. There's a formula to it, but it's out there, right? I think anybody that does it will gladly tell you, you just got to put in the work, treat it like a job. It is a, a piece of you, right? Like this is something I wake up every day. I know the first thing I'm going to do, make coffee, hit vape pen, type LinkedIn post. That is my day every day. And now it's uh, a situation, it's such a beautiful situation where you can schedule posts. So uh, that makes it within the platform. Um, one thing that's been really helpful, I know for me, uh, has been I'm a LinkedIn creator. And so when uh, I entered into the program, I thought it was, it was, it's been so helpful having this person there who's like, hey, just to let you know, we're starting something new. We've got beta testing that you can do for all of these different things. So, you know, in, in the olden years when we did not have data, we didn't have, you couldn't see what your reach or any of those things were within LinkedIn. Now we have it. And it's so wonderful. The fact that I can schedule within the platform is perfect because I can't tell you how many times I'm like, oh my God, I need to put this as a post, but <laughs> it's like 10 PM right now. No one's going to see it. And I can put it in my note, in my like notes app. But at the same time, like the fire that I feel and typing it out is like happening right now. And so um, I've loved, I love the fact that we now have that capability. Um, one thing that I wanted to tie into with what Brett was saying um, earlier is the piece around the comment section. Uh, I I use LinkedIn. The, I was using Instagram previously when I first got into the cannabis industry a lot. I knew that I wanted to start a business eventually. Like that's that's been part of my even when I was a kid, I was like, I know one day I'm going to be a CEO. I know one day I'm going to do, I'm going to have a business. And uh, when I was laid off from Leafly, I, uh, I was like, I don't want to leave the cannabis industry. So I was like, what do I want to do next? Do I want to stay in marketing? Things ended up happening very organically for me. But one thing that I was explicit about doing almost every day was posting on Instagram. And it was a way that I was able to do a lot of audience listening around what are the issues that people are dealing with right now. I still was in the mindset that there's not a lot of people on LinkedIn. After a while, more people did get on LinkedIn. And now that comment section, the conversations that are happening, that is one of the main, that is one of the primary ways that I do audience listening. I know that I have a consultancy. And so with that in mind, I have to, there's going to all, it's going to always be evolving. It's going to be evolving based on what the market needs, what the pain points are. Um, one mission that like I've always held personally is around supporting and empowering underrepresented cannabis entrepreneurs and professionals. And it is impossible to do that when when you don't have insight into what people are dealing with, what their what things are are standing in their way. And so even thinking about recently, there was uh, someone who posted about being really upset uh, that a consultancy that he worked with or an agency that he worked with wasn't, like didn't didn't turn out right and and he felt really upset about it and he was like this is the last time I'm working with an agency again 
And I know me and Brett were both in the comments, like talking to this guy, but as he's giving all of this information around what is hard for him, like what is, has frustrated him in this relationship, I'm like, okay, well, how could we solve for these problems? Because in one way, some of the things that you're saying are like you issues, but then other things that you're saying are legitimate. And I've heard it from other people before. I've experienced it personally as being someone who's had to use agencies. I've worked in agencies and now I have an agency. And so um, that is, I still do surveys. I still do a lot of like, hey, I would love to just talk to you for 30 minutes and see what are some of the things that you're working on right now? What are some of the issues that you're dealing with? But those comment sections in the posts that Brett puts out, the posts that others put out around their frustrations, around things that just aren't right, um, or they don't feel as right, or their, fresh, their uh, issues with whatever it may be, for me, I'm taking in all of that as like a researcher, like, oh my God, okay, well, how could I solve for this? How can I ensure that, you know, there is more price transparency, that there is more um, transparency into like how other agencies are, are working? Like, is this a good agency to use? Is this a good freelancer to use? Is this a good client that a freelancer would actually want to work with? And so, um, so much of what I have to do as a business owner is the, I have to understand what the market needs, but I also have to understand what they're dealing with. And so LinkedIn, it's like, I'm able to kill so many birds with one stone because I can do the research. I also use LinkedIn sales navigator. So I'm able to prospect through it. Um, and it is just kind of a, it is, it is such a powerful tool with so many powerful supporting tools for business owners. And if what I'd like to do also is kind of like pivot a little bit, because, you know, we're talking about all the different ways that we as professionals and as, uh, you know, people who have an audience take advantage of the platform, right? You're killing like lots of birds with this one stone. But I think another piece of it that's interesting is that it doesn't necessarily have to be about promoting ourselves or promoting the company we work for. Yeah. It can also be about uh, promoting a specific idea or a specific um, conversation within the industry. So specifically, Sarah, you know, with the work that you at Ritual do with the consumption lounge movement, obviously consumption lounges are kind of like the next step. It's the, it's the future of cannabis industry. And um, I, I'd love for you to share with us in terms of how LinkedIn has been helpful in terms of like driving that conversation too. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that always reach out to me, right, who are trying to give me these B2B leads, or they're trying to connect me with other people. And what I found is like, it's much easier to go on a website, see who these winners are for some of these licenses and do the work yourself on LinkedIn or other platforms. Um, and along with that, it's not just having the direct connections to some of these people that you really need to be working with. Um, it really kind of is just really allowing you to be um, a, a voice of something that's to come. You know, you said futurist earlier, which I really appreciate because sometimes I feel like I'm just super early to a party, but I have tons and tons and tons of info to share. And it's not even about the info that I have or what I've learned, but it's getting this new industry up to speed. Uh, something I just posted the other day was that like these Nevada lounges Actually, none of the products that are um, in the marketplace in Nevada are going to be able to be, for the most part, um, consumed in these spaces. So now we need the entire supply chain to get involved. If, if I really had to reach out to every single one of these companies independently and create those movements, oh my gosh, it would be such a, a, like a long drawn out process. But now I can post something once or twice on LinkedIn to a larger group of people who actually are going to pay attention and care what I have to say. And it's really just helping me get further along without, you know, tons and tons of time on the back end for something that's not really going to help me. It's not, I'm not getting paid for those things, but it's really just, here's what's coming. Pay Like if you're, if you're paying attention, I appreciate it because you know everything is going to look different 
in this, in this next wave of things. So just being able to have a voice on LinkedIn and, you know, like four years ago, I felt like I wasn't even in the cannabis industry. I was struggling to feel part of it because it's such a new, a new, um, sector that we're building out here that it's easy to feel a little removed at all times. So LinkedIn definitely helped me share my vision, share my my ideas and realize that there are people who, that really did care about this and what's coming and pay attention. And now I feel even more of a sense of community and togetherness because of it. So it's really more about, you know, how keep the elevation. I, I love what Brett said earlier about kind of like the challenges and saying things that you say at the water cooler out loud, because it's not the, the future of cannabis is not all peachy and rainbows. And so if we're talking about elevation and how we keep moving forward and the future, uh, we have to have those hard conversations. And it's I'm so happy that there are people that are, you know, willing to speak up and say those things so that things change. I mean, like one of the early things I said was I kind of spoke out against Mike Tyson and I have no problem doing that now because he's harmful. I think that's detrimental to women. And this is a female plant at the end of the day. So if no one's like willing to step up and say these things in a male dominated industry, how are we going to move forward? Um, and so like, I just really appreciate having, you know, a group like this, that's willing to like speak up, say things that are necessary to like really move the conversation in a more positive light. Man, Sarah, you just gave me an idea for a whole other panel. I'm going to connect <laughs> with you after. <laughs> um, okay, so we have been getting a lot of questions, as I'm sure you all have, um, you know, so you guys all knew that this was going to happen. Everyone is asking, how do I do it, right? How do, how do I get more engagement on LinkedIn? How do I know what to post? How do I know when to post? You know, not everyone sets out to be, you know, like a huge thought leader or an influencer, but, you know, people want to be heard. So if you guys want to share some of your best practices, things that have worked well for you, any posts that have gone like crazy viral that you weren't expecting, um, everyone wants to hear it. Yeah. Ooh, pick um, me, pick me. Let me okay, go. let's go let's, ahead, Brad. Go go ahead. On this one? <laughs> All right. Yes. So I saw a question a little bit ago. Uh, and I gave a kind of short answer because I was trying to t type and listen. Consistency is key, particularly on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is what, what in the marketing world we call a content deficient platform. Something like two to 3% of users actually produce content regularly, as opposed to a normal, normal social media channel like Twitter or Instagram, where something like 70% of accounts are producing content regularly. So for for LinkedIn, uh, in particular, it is purely a numbers and consistency game to start. There are more to it, right? Uh, so for me, I break posts down into five different categories. Uh, the question that was posed that I asked, answered kind of quickly in the Q&A was, how do you know what to post? The easiest cheat sheet version is look at other people's posts and type a reply, right? Like think of something, agree, disagree, doesn't matter format it that way, right? And you'll even notice if you're on the mobile app, LinkedIn suggests that when you make a comment. If you drop a comment, you're like, nope, don't agree, you suck, you know, here's my opinion. A lot of the times it'll prompt you. So that's a, a quick cheat sheet version. But my, my five categories are pretty simple. One of them is observational. Make an observation about the industry with your opinion. You know, uh, I don't agree with this. Have you ever noticed this? One of them is going to be business advice or like life advice, right? So like in my experience from, you know, insert qualifications here, here is what I have learned that you should do. That's basically what I'm doing right now. Uh, number three is going to be personal stories. Humanize yourself. It might be a B2B platform primarily, but business is human to human. I don't care how big the corporation is. At the end of the day, it's two human beings. Talk about your kids, talk about your wife, talk about your family, talk about your animals. I don't care. Be a human being. Show a little more than just like, I am marketing robot, pay attention to me, right? Uh, so number four is kind of an amalgamation of those, and that would be allegories. So like, uh, you know, hey, this happened to me. Let me tell you about this and the lesson I learned from it. And then the last one is what I will loosely call humor or throwaway posts show a little bit of pizzazz, right? Like, let's call it like it is. LinkedIn was boring as crap a couple of years ago. And now people like me and others 
man, I will post memes all day. I will post ridiculous memes about being too high at home or about how vape cartridges remind me of the old cartridges we had as a kid. Like you can be normal on LinkedIn, right? Like it's not like this like stuffy boardroom anymore. Even if you look at the LinkedIn commercials, like they literally have commercials where it's like dude with purple hair skateboarding in, like lady with green hair, like flipping into her desk chair and saying like, you know, this is professional. Those are okay now. So if you really wanna do what we do, right? Like follow a format, post every day. Uh, I'm gonna get yelled at by my boss for this one, but quality or consistency over quality. That doesn't mean say ridiculous things, right? That doesn't mean like put yourself in hot water. That doesn't mean uh, you know, do something that would reflect negatively on yourself, your company, your investors, your brand, whatever it is. But what it does mean is don't overthink it. It doesn't have to be this like hardcore engagement driven post. And I'm going to let everybody in on a secret. My most viral posts that have hit hundreds of thousands of views were ones that I was just kind of like, yeah, okay, it's out. And the ones where I'm like, Ooh, I got this down to a science. I know, right? Like I know how to do LinkedIn. They suck. They get, they fall off the radar. And it's, it's almost a, a guarantee. Uh, and I'm going to give three quick tips and I'll shut up. Don't put an external link in your post ever. LinkedIn is a content publishing platform. They have article and newsletter features. They do not want you to leave the site. They make money from advertising. Links in the body of your post will kill it. Stop right now. Number two, don't overdo it with hashtags. This is not Instagram. It is not 2012. Three to five are all you need. Three to five are all you need. Let me say it one more time. Three to five are all you need. Put them in the body of your post. Don't be overly specific. So like, you'll notice, read any of my posts. I will say blah, 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 hashtag cannabis industry in the middle of the sentence. Or man, I really love smoking hashtag cannabis in the middle of the sentence, right? Like let it flow because there's two very specific algorithms that you're trying to trigger. One of them is the relevance algorithm, meaning is this something that my audience or the people who are in my network want to see? And the other one is the dwell algorithm. By adding that little stuff at the bottom, it makes the bottom of your post look crappy, which should be the second best part of your post. And that brings me to my third one. That weird choppy copy you see all of us do is on purpose, where it's single sentences. 85% of LinkedIn users are on mobile. The dwell algorithm wants them slowly scrolling through it. It rewards that style of post. And let's be very real here. In uh, journalism and public relations world, there is above the fold and below the fold. Think of a newspaper. The shit you see when it's in the little box is above the fold. Put that in the first three to five lines so that someone has to click see more to see the rest. Don't put the good shit at the beginning, right? Put that crazy headline, put that obnoxious opinion, put that attention getter at the start, make them click more and then break it down, right? Then give your nuanced response, then get to the point. But the goal is, let's be very real here. If you're trying to grow an audience and you're trying to get engagement, those are the little hacks, right? Like, and now I will shut up and get off my high horse of excitement. And we should take those from Brett because I think we all know that like out of the four of us, his content is like half of all of our engagement combined. And he's also the one that's posting every single day. So like, I really, I learned a lot even from you just saying that. So I really appreciate that. And it goes to show the engagement that you get from putting in that work. Yeah. And there's a few tools I know when it comes to um, creating content and trying to just figure out where to start, I mean, everything that Brett said is spot on and just getting started. I think that is like the most important first step is just like just getting started. We can talk about strategy all the time, but if you're so bogged down by the strategy piece and you're like, oh my God, I'm just... I don't know if this is right. Like sometimes we just, <clears throat> we do overthink it. But um, if you are a person who's like, okay, I just, I am struggling to even post more than once a week, 
just push yourself to post twice a week. It doesn't matter what it is. You got to get the reps in to get the practice in. And then over time, it's going to become more natural. You're going to know more about your audience. You're going to feel less nervous about it. So you're not going to overthink it so much. Yeah. Um, I know a, a few resources that I use uh, for planning content is um, I use something called, um, or I'll do the easy one first. I use Reddit a lot. Um, I use Reddit as a place where if I am wondering, you know, what, what is an image or what is a conversation that's going on around cannabis on Reddit that has a lot of people just buzzing about it. It has a lot of upvotes, downvotes. There's a lot of conversation, a lot of comments on it. Then sometimes I will bring that over to LinkedIn. Um, Another thing that I use is a site called Answer the Public. It is amazing. I use it for almost all of the content that I create uh, across platforms. Um, even when it comes to our newsletter, uh, Answer the Public is amazing because what it'll show you is it'll show you things that people are already asking about. If I go into Answer the Public and I say, um, cannabis dispensaries. I'm going to get this amazing graphic that's going to show me what people are searching for, the terminology that they're using to search for certain topics, for that topic. So I might find that people are mostly searching for how to start a dispensary. Okay, well, that could be a blog post. That could be a newsletter. And the great thing about LinkedIn is that everything that you create within LinkedIn well, most everything, not your individual posts, but your newsletters and your uh, articles that you write within uh, LinkedIn, they also contribute to your SEO. So if you have your website um, attached to your LinkedIn, if you're posting articles in LinkedIn, if you are creating newsletters in LinkedIn, all of those things are, are findable or discoverable through SEO. So it is truly an SEO play. And then when you pair it, with a platform or with a website like Answer the Public, where you are seeing exactly how people are searching for these topics that you might specialize in, or uh, there might be discussion around, you can see exactly how they are typing it into their computer. And then you can make your headlines, you can uh, put keywords from there you can you can inform yourself uh in that way you can also click on you know however they're searching when you go to the website you'll know what i'm talking about but you can click on how someone is um searching for a topic and then you can see every single article that's been written about it so you can see what the top article is under um that search term and then you can leverage those keywords, you can leverage um, uh, some of those headings in order to get your SEO up. Um, so that's one thing, answer the public, Reddit. Uh, and then there's one more thing, what was it? Um, oh, that's what it was. Someone asked, oh, two things. Another thing that you can go to, I'll put a link here but it is called uh, your social selling index score. And a lot of the things that Brett, I'll put it in the comments here, that Brett was talking about around um, figuring out like how you're doing, uh, you can go to the link that I just put in the comments. You can look at your social selling index score. And even though you all may not be businesses, you may just be creators, uh, you can see how where your profile ranks amongst all of all, all other uh, LinkedIn profiles. If you have a score that's over 70, then you're doing really well. If you have a score under 70, you got some work to do and you can see exactly what four elements you should be engaging more with. And it has explanations around it, but that's something that's worthwhile in keeping your, your eye out on so that you can know if you're on the right track. Um, I saw a couple of questions that I, I think are pretty important, uh, in the comments. And one was about, well, but I will say I'll kind of hold off on that. Uh, Aisha, but 
I want other people. Yeah, to we're going to leave a little bit of time because there have been some questions come in and I just want to make sure that we get through like the meat yeah. and potatoes and then we can, we can accessorize with these other um, topics at the end, Let's right? Okay. Yeah. And I wanted to add just like a little bit to that. Cause I'm actually very different than both of you guys. Cause I've never really done any of that on my LinkedIn. What at all. And I'm really not even scheduling posts at this point. For me, it's like if I'm if I'm in a room or I hear something or someone says something and we're have and I feel like it is a good conversation, or if I'm like racking my brain on something and I feel like, oh, I could use more help on LinkedIn, or maybe this is a good discussion is really when I just like go to post. Uh, and there's really not a ton of thought behind it, but it's really more of like the thought provoking things that maybe I would have said on Twitter a few years ago, whereas now I'm like, let me go to a real community who's paying attention that'll actually care what I have to say. Um, so I definitely think that that is, you know, a big part of it as well. And then I don't, I think it also goes to like, you don't really know what people are going to love. You don't know what kind of content people are really going to find and, and be, you know, driven to. And my biggest post or the one that got the most engagement doesn't really have anything to do with consumption lounges. So that really showed me it was more about being a female in this space, the CEO, the CEO conversation versus CEO and kind of just showing me that I can also be a, a voice for female entrepreneurs, for female leaders. And it's not really just about the consumption world, but it's just about, you know, other factors, other elements that we're bringing into this space. So that was really an eye-opening thing for me that just showed continue saying or, or voicing things that are coming up and not really focusing on curating my content too much. But again, every single person is going to be so different for that. I couldn't have asked for a better segue. Thank you for teeing that up, Sarah, because that's, <laughs> it's, it's something that I think makes a big difference too. When we talk about humanizing yourself and, and, you know, putting personal things on LinkedIn, a lot of us, us and, and people out there, you know, you have like your business message, but then there's also the piece of you that you're sharing with your audience. And a lot of times it does combined with your business, specifically about who you are, you know, Brett, I know you, you post a lot about being a veteran and how that relates to the work that you do. And, you know, all of us have an example of that. Um, did, would you say that that one post that you've, uh, Sarah, that you were talking about when you were posting about being a woman in the industry, that's really what got you the most engagements. People could relate to you in that way as a woman, as a working woman, as a business owner. Yeah. Totally. And I, I think that, that that showed me that there's more there's more of a voice for me as a woman in cannabis. Like I said earlier, the plant is female. I love that more women are coming into this space. So it was more empowering as well, that there's more things that we can talk about than just our source, our, you know, quote unquote career, but what defines us, what's in that career, what are we bringing to the table in this space and how are we continuing to elevate? With that, I'm going to actually send it back to Brittany, because I don't know if this is one of the questions that you were going to answer, but, you know, talking about the intersection of the platform you have and also being a voice and, and supporting, you know, people who don't get as much support in the industry or maybe people who don't have as much access. Um, I, I'll, I'll stop there because I don't want to take away your your flame here, but um, this is something that I know you're really passionate about. Uh, yeah, so I think I mentioned earlier, um, one of the big things that has always been kind of a driving mission of mine, uh, beyond just a green legacy, but really a life calling, I, I suppose, is really trying to support people who are entrepreneurs and professionals, underrepresented folks. I love the cannabis industry, so that is the vehicle in which I am doing that work right now, um, but that's always been a really big mission of mine. Uh, another thing is, you know, I know I became an entrepreneur because I was fucking tired. Sorry for the language, but I was tired of a building for other people who just saw me as a number. I know I knew that I wanted to have control over what I was doing, who I was working with. And I wanted to be able to have my own voice and that not be uh, dampened or, or softened for anyone. And so um, that's part of the reason that I became an entrepreneur. Uh, and I want that same freedom for other people. And so I know for myself, I speak a lot about women in leadership, and I've always done that for the most part. Um, I speak a lot about Black people in leadership and people of color within spaces where 
oftentimes we end up being an only. Um, I also talk a lot about workers' rights. Those things have nothing to do with marketing. They have nothing to do with marketing. They have nothing to do with, uh, with my consultancy, but those are, those, that is, those are parts of my values. Those are my value systems. Those are things that I care about. And um, I think oftentimes what can happen and things that I've thought about too, and I've had to, you know, make peace with is that I'm not going to always be everybody's cup of tea and that's okay because baby, you don't have to like me, but what I do know, <laughs> but what I, but what I do know is that the people who I, I am, all of the things that I'm doing, I'm doing it for the people who are going to be like, well, damn, I didn't know that I had that kind of power. I could just say that out loud. Um, and so that's what drives me a lot. I, there was a few questions that went into monetizing essentially. So people asking for free labor. Um, someone else also asked about um, how not to isolate or uh, uh, ostracize people who may not be in cannabis or businesses that may not be in cannabis or larger businesses. Um, I speak out about MSOs pretty regularly. I speak out about shitty small businesses too. Um, and at the end of the day, if you try to scorch the earth, this is true in all marketing. If you try to scorch the earth, you you are not going to get anything. You, you are not going to get anyone. So if you are um, if you are trying to contort yourself in order to be digestible to every audience, to every type of business owner, you're not going to get anybody. So you have to be very clear about what your values are, what you care about. You also have to be very clear about what you do and what you offer. People know that I people come to me because they're like, oh, you're the only person that I know in cannabis. People also sometimes come to me because they're like, you're the only black woman I know in cannabis. People also come to me for these things because they because I have attached my personal brand to cannabis. But with that being said, a lot of people come to me because they're like, I know that you're in marketing. And even though I'm not a cannabis business, I feel like there might be some overlap. Can you help me out with anything? And so there are still op opportunities that come from outside of cannabis that are still marketing related because so much of what I do is, is still connected to marketing. I also get pulled in to talk about how to um, get a job in cannabis or how to hire in cannabis. And that is something that, you know, I end up, I do more speaking engagements probably on that topic than anything else. And it's partially because that is so much of what I talk about. I want to see more people who are underrepresented in positions of, of actual power uh, within the cannabis industry. I want to see um, people being able to start their businesses without all of this uh, in, in with a with a supportive community. I want to see people being able to monetize their their newsletters, their social posts. We oftentimes people who are um, people who are historically marginalized, whether they're women, whether they're trans folks, whether they're black or brown, oftentimes we are asked to do so many things for free. We're actually, like data shows this, that we are asked to do speaking engagements, amplifying others and those sorts of things for free, uh, more so than white men. Uh, if we look at it in, in, all, of these, in all of these other uh, intersections, uh, we are asked to do that more than white men are ever asked. And so I am okay, I am comfortable saying, oh, I'm sorry, I do not have space to do anything for, for uh, free or do any like consulting outside of what I'm already offering right now. Um, but feel free to reach out to me in six months, I might have some time. I'm more than happy to help people uh, when I can and to give out my labor for free when I can, but I have learned and I have 
um, gotten to a point where I'm also very comfortable being able to say, Hey baby, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't feed you from an empty plate. <laughs> like I, I have all of these other things going on too. I would love to support you. Follow me on, on LinkedIn. A lot of valuable content happens there. Here's a few articles that might be helpful, but sometimes we have to say no and it's okay to say no. And there's power in saying no. Um, but it is up to us to ensure that people respect our time. It's not, I can't get upset because people keep asking me to do free labor if I keep giving free labor. And so uh, we have to be empowered to say no. We have to be empowered to also say, you know, like you got to do a little bit of research before you come to me. Like <laughs> there are people who, who will like come to my DMs and it'll be a really basic question that I'm like, man, you could have Googled this. So, so we have to, we have to do that for ourselves. I'm still getting cold calls after I posted last week that I like hate cold calls and like don't cold call me because I'm on calls all day. And to me, that just showed you didn't look at my profile. You didn't take the time to get to know me or my content or what I'm about before reaching out to me. And I yep. can't. Say and I ignore those people, Sarah. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I ignore those people. Like, <laughs> if you are coming to me about something that you could easily see on my profile or you, or someone DMs me and they're like, I see that you have a business. Yeah. Do you need, Do you need more leads? Do you want a franchise opportunity today? <laughs> yeah. I'm Why would you interested in packaging solutions for your non-tangible goods? Delete. Yes. And okay. I will delete somebody. I will also ignore somebody. And sometimes if I'm not in a good mood, I'll be like, you didn't even look at my profile, did you? <laughs> and that's what I said that too is like I'm Island. sure most women at least have gotten some creepers trying to like use LinkedIn as a dating site as well yes. not just the ladies I get creepers too and it's <laughs> real <laughs> weird like <laughs> weird stuff not even like normal creeping like real weird creeping where you're like <sighs> hmm <laughs> yes like just I post about week. my wife at least once a week Everybody, she's like a side character in my like narrative. Like one time she got recognized in a raincoat with a mask and sunglasses on from across a crowd at Emerald Cup with 30,000 people there. And she's like, how do you know who I am? And the guy's like, I love Brett's LinkedIn content. You're like <gasps> this background character in it. And I'm like, oh God, that's creepy. But I feel the way, like I knew that person and it was a mild miscommunication and he's super cool, but that's like so a creepy. real thing. <laughs> This might be the moment where I need to reel this in, right? I feel like this can go How somewhere else at this point. Personality so, to get out. Well, look, I mean, we're talking about being a LinkedIn influencer, and this is part of that package, right? The more audience you have, the more attention you have. You are going to have these, you know, sometimes that attention is not what you're looking for and you got to know how to manage it. So that advice is also super helpful. I will say, oh, I'm watching the chats come out. Sorry, Brad. I had to like, <laughs> I had to shut down the party here. Um, but look, we are running up on time and I can't express how happy and pleased I am that this conversation has been so engaging. I mean, the people who are watching the audience, you guys have been amazing with your questions. Um, you know, the way that you're contributing, I really, I couldn't have asked for more. So I will say Thank you. Thank you to all of you who are out there watching us. Thank you, Brett, for being so generous with your knowledge and your time just in there in the chats, just like schooling everyone, Sarah and, and Brittany. I mean, it's it's been an amazing conversation. And I will say, you know, in this conversation, it kind of sparks new ideas on other things that we should be talking about. And C-Lab does put on educational programming every month. So if there is a topic that you really want to hear people speak about, you know, message us, message me, you know, message C-Lab or Flower Hire. Talk about the things that matter to you in this industry, things that you want to learn more about, because that's that's what we're here to do. So um, with that being said, you know, we are up on our hour. And I, of course, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We will be LinkedIn. You know where to find us. 
please connect with us, send us messages. We're happy to, you know, continue the conversation on our favorite platform. And don't forget, uh, nod to our sponsors, C-Lab, join C-Lab.com and flowerhire.com as well. Have a wonderful afternoon and we will see you on LinkedIn. <laughs>